I think I think we've gone live. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday morning. My, the world can change in just <laughs> in just twenty four hours. But anyway, yeah, there's plenty of other people making comments on the news. Anyway, today we're on the equinox of the gods and the magical pantheons of the new aeon. Uh, the part of angels, demons, and gods of the new millennium uh, called the procession of the equinoxes and the metamorphosis of the gods. Now, we've just gone through uh, a little review of the astrological uh, ages, the uh, 2100-year uh, cycles. But now we're returning uh, to the thrust of the ex essay, actually. Uh, a new way of looking at major ages in human consciousness. And I'll back up just a little bit from yesterday's. The reader may ask at this point, <clears throat> what modification in human consciousness could possibly see, be so universal as to justify an equinox of the gods? The answer, not surprisingly, involves humanity's evolving perception of our relationship with the primary god of our solar system, the sun. In order for us to more easily understand the magical significance of the new aeon, let's just take a moment to trace the trajectory upon which our evolving solar consciousness has propelled us the last two aeons. The Aeon of Isis. The formula of the great goddess. It's impossible for us to pinpoint the dawn of the Aeon of Isis. As we learned in our discussion of the astrological ages, evidence of the worship of the great goddess is, fo is found as far back as the age of Leo. At this period, when humanity was struggling with the first attempts at social intercourse, the most awesome mystery to excite the imagination was the power of woman. More than any other observable phenomena, woman was most godlike. Each month, coinciding with the rhythmic cycles of the moon, she issued blood. Yet miraculously, she did not die. When the cycle of bleeding stopped, her body changed. Her breasts and belly swelled for nine moons until she burst with water and new life. Because the earliest Isian agers were as yet unaware of the cause and effect relationship between sex and birth, it appeared that woman alone was the source of human life. Her life-giving powers were, were not limited to blood and birth, for from her breasts flowed milk, a rich white blood, to nourish and sustain the new life she created. Woman was the human embodiment of the earth itself, which appeared to spontaneously bring forth vegetarian uh, vegetation and animals needed to sustain the race. It was the most self-evident fact of life. Earth was mother. Mother was life, God was woman. To be in harmony with the formula of the great goddess was profoundly simple, and as long as it was universally perceived that life and nourishment came directly from the earth and from woman, all successful endeavors, magical practices, and religious expressions did her homage. 
this perceived reality was deeply impressed upon our ancestors' minds. And long after they solved the mysteries of where babies came from, they clung tenaciously to the outward forms of goddess worship. And based and based all social and religious institutions on her formula. Eventually, however, as our understanding of the universe around us grew, we were confronted with a more complicated worldview and a new and new unsettling mysteries. The Aeon of Osiris came next. The formula of the dying God. Even though the formula of the dying God became crystallized in the religions and institutions of the astrological age of Pisces, the Aeon of Osiris dawned much earlier. The advent of agricultural societies necessitated a greater awareness of the cycles of the seasons. Osirian age farmers began to recognize the effects of sunlight, or the lack of it, had upon vegetarian vegetation. I'm bound and determined to bring vegetarians into this discussion. <laughs> they observed that certain times of year, the days grew short and crops did not grow. It eventually became evident that even though the earth brought forth life, the supreme creative energy that vivified that life came from the sun. Coincidental with this discovery was the universal acknowledgement of the role men played in the procreative process. Just as plant life needed the warm, penetrating rays of sunlight to flourish, so too woman needed the introduction of the male sperm to avoid being forever barren. the heretofore unrecognized concept of fatherhood became a dominant theme. The Aeon of Osiris truly began when our forebears raised their eyes to heaven and woke up to the fact that life on earth was a partnership of sun and earth. And the life of the race was a partnership of man and woman. However, the partnership was not perceived as being equal. And as we learned in our discussion of the astrological age of Taurus, the male backlash was severe and unmerciful. Deity was now male a father, and his po power was likened to that of the sun. Even though this shift of consciousness was the result of a more accurate assessment of the facts of life than was realized in the age of Isis, it was not quite accurate enough. A defect in the perception of cosmological facts plunged our Osirian age ancestors into a dark and terrifying insecurity crisis that traumatized the race so severely that we still suffer its effects. This fundamental flaw in understanding caused us to switch our focus from the mystery of where life comes from to an obsessive Preoccupation with death. This tragic misunderstanding focused on the belief that each day the sun was born at dawn in the east and died in the evening in the west. Speculations abounded about where the dead sun went during the darkness of night 
and if, indeed, a new one would ever appear again in the East. Perhaps it went to the land of the dead, where we temporarily visit during our nightly little death of sleep. The terrors and ecstasies of our dreams form the archetypes of heaven and hell. And after we die, who better to judge our worthiness for either place than the dead sun itself? Who created and sustained us during our stay on earth? This is precisely the part the god Osiris would play in the Egyptian mythology. And Christ's role in Christianity. To further complicate these fears, the sun's yearly escapades caused even greater anxiety. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Each year, at the zenith of the sun's power in summer, it was observed that each day it it rose and set a little further south. And this, of course, these directions uh, assume uh, a position in the northern hemisphere. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, obviously, everything would be reversed. <clears throat> it was observed that each day it rose and set a little south of where it did the day before. Around harvest time, the days grew noticeably shorter, and the specter of the empty harvested fields accented the leafless trees and the browning grasses and painted a melancholy and frightening portrait of nature in articulo mortis. It was unsettling enough to have the sun completely disappear each day, but if it continued to head south until night was perpetual, how long would the world survive in cold darkness before a new sun appears? In an attempt to calm the shattered nerves caused by such musings, a few wise souls took a deep breath and attempted to look at the big picture. Yes, the sun dies each evening in the West, but years of observation and testimony of the oldest members of society indicated that no one could remember a time when another one didn't come up in the East with, within a relatively short time. Yes, the sun becomes weak and almost dies each year, but the same observations and testimony revealed that eventually it reverses its journey south and, and the days grow longer again until a new cycle of life returns to the earth. Based on the best information at their disposal, they concluded that magical power, an unknown and supernatural force, was responsible for the sun's resurrection. They further surmised that the secret of this magic must be hidden in the very nature of the sun itself. And if they could only harmonize with that nature, then perhaps they too could overcome death. Everywhere they looked in nature, they saw the sun cycle of birth, life, death, and resurrection. They saw it reenacted. They observed that plants sprout to the surface in spring and grew tall and strong in the long and warm days of, of uh, summer sunlight. Then in autumn, at the height of their maturity, they put forth seeds and then died or were cut down at harvest time. 
like the earth itself, the seeds lay dead and buried. Throughout the lifeless winter, only to spring to life, when the rains and lengthening rays of the sun transform the soil into a moist, warm womb. They also observed accelerated plant growth near the decaying remains of animals or people, and wherever large amounts of blood spilled upon the ground. This wonder was the male solar counterpart of the female lunar mystery of menstruation. The parallels between sun and phallus, sunlight and semen, the fertilizing power of semen had upon woman and that blood had upon the earth did not escape our Osirian ancestors' fertile imaginations. A new fact of life, one that conformed to the secret nature of the sun, became the magical formula of the aeon. Life comes from death. In order to harmonize with the new formula, it would become necessary to take an active role in the great death-life drama. For the earliest members of the Aeon of Osiris, human sacrifice was the supreme pantomime of the sun's daily and yearly sacrifice to the earth. It also illustrated the sacrifice of the potency of the phallus after ejaculation and the seed's sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection. The spilling of human blood in the unsown or newly planted fields resulted in a noticeable increase in the fecundity of the harvest. The most comforting benefit derived from such bloody forms of religious expressions was the undeniable fact that as long as they continued the sacrifices, the sun always came up in the morning and always stopped its journey south and returned to bring spring and summer. This put a tremendous amount of power in the hands of the priests and priestesses who wielded the sacrificial knife. They positioned themselves between the people and the gods and implied personal responsibility for the rebirth of the sun. With each dawn, they became demonstrably more powerful. At regular intervals, all over the world, the ceremonial slaughter of the divine king assured a bountiful harvest and the well-being of the people even though the future victim was titular head of state, he was not a ruler in the modern sense. He was the living embodiment of the sun and therefore supreme monarch of the earth. His periodic murder and the coronation of his successor were occasions of great solemnity. In the waning years of the Aeon of Osiris, the character of the sacrifice evolved from human blood to animal blood to bread and wine. Among the more mystically inclined, sacrifice became a personal and transcendent experience. Nevertheless, such changes did nothing to disturb the basic magical formula of the Aeon of Osiris. The cycle of birth, life, death, and resurrection remained the dominant theme right up 
to the time of the magical revival of the late 19th century. By this time, however, the old formula was no longer based upon misinformation. It was built upon denial. And now, uh, if you don't mind it going uh, another uh, uh, five or ten minutes here on Saturday morning, I'll finish up with the current Aeon, the Aeon of Horus. The Formula of the Crowned and Conquering Child Earlier, we learned that long after our Icean Age ancestors solved the reproductive mysteries, they continued to cling to a magical formula that originated at a time when it was believed that all life came spontaneously from woman and earth. So too, in the age of, uh, in the Aeon of Osiris, long after it was common knowledge that the earth revolves around the sun, the great religions and political institutions continued to be obsessed with death and resurrection as if they still believed that the sun died every day. In 340 BC, Aristotle surmised that during a lunar eclipse, it was the shadow of the earth that darkened the moon. As the shadow was obviously round, he proclaimed the earth was a sphere. It was also clear that to Aristotle that the sun did not die, but radiated continuously. He continued to believe the earth was the center of the universe and the sun and all the other heavenly bodies revolved about us. Night was just an illusion caused by the shifting shadow of the earth as the sun passed behind us each day. Ptolemy, in the second century AD, enlarged Aristotle's theory by postulating the earth, still as the center of the universe, was, as it were, at the center of a glass onion, surrounded by eight spherical layers containing the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and then beyond that, the fixed stars. He did not speculate what might lie beyond the sphere of the fixed stars. This pleased the young Christian church no end because now they had a universe with room for heaven and hell. In 1514, Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish priest, cautiously put forward the idea that the sun was suspended in a fixed position and the earth and all the planets orbited in circular paths. Nobody paid much attention to Copernicus until nearly a hundred years later when Johannes Kepler in Germany and Galileo Galilei in Italy dusted off his work and found themselves in agreement. To drive the final stake into the heart of Aristotle, Ptolemy and the Church, Galileo in 1609, peered through his newly invented telescope and observed moons happily orbiting the planet Jupiter. This information displeased the church very much. Galileo was accused of advancing a scripturally incorrect model of the universe. After all, if the Earth revolved around the sun and other moons could orbit other planets, then Earth could not be God's unique creation. Galileo was forced to disclaim his findings. But he grumbled under his breath. Even with the disapproval of the church, it did not take long for the theory of our heliocentric solar system to become an unquestioned reality for all but the most isolated or mentally disenfranchised inhabitants of our planet. For hundreds of years, mothers have argued, excuse me, for hundreds of years, mothers have assured their little ones at bedtime 
that the sun is not gone, only shining on the other side of the earth. It was this simple reassuring truth that's the key to the formula of the Aeon of Horus. It's not a formula of nourishment. It's not a formula of life, catastrophe and resurrection, but a formula based upon the magic of continual growth. In the Aeon of Isis, we identified with the earth. Life came miraculously from the earth and woman. All magical pantheons were aspects of the goddess. Death was a mystery whose depths were impossible to plumb. In the Aeon of Osiris, we identified with the dying, resurrected sun. All magical pantheons were aspects of God the Father. Death could be magically overcome by obedience to formula, rites, and doctrines. In the Aeon of Horus, <clears throat> we identify with the self radiant, ever living sun. All magical pantheons have become aspects of ourselves. We, like the sun, do not die. Death, like night, is an illusion. Life is now seen as a process of continual growth and humanity is developing a consciousness of the continuity of existence that will eventually dissolve the sting of death. What pantheon of gods could possibly preside over a world where every man and every woman is a star, self-radiant and co-equal to every other star in the universe. What powers or agencies still govern an environment populated by independent creative beings? The answer becomes obvious when we grasp the fact that we are running out of cosmic elbow room. When all is said and done, worshipers of the new millennium are left with three fundamental deities. The absolutely biggest one, the absolutely smallest one, and the one that is everything between the other two. New Aeon devotees still worship the great goddess, the goddess of infinite space, whose body forms the expanding universe. Her symbolic form is that of the circumference of a circle. She is woman, mother, earth on a cosmic scale. All that ever was, is, and is to come is nestled within her body. The Icean formula of spontaneous life and nourishment has been amended to encompass the entire universe. It is now the milk of the stars that flows from her paps. The new Aeon devotees still worship the All-Father, an equal counterpart to the great goddess. But he is the universe infinitely contracted. His symbolic form is a point within the circle. There is absolute equality between these two infinities, 
for one could not be without the other. The Osirian formula of life, death, resurrection has been transcended to reveal a self-perpetuated and continuous resurrection. And finally, new aeon devotees still worship the offspring of the great goddess and the all-father. The conception of this child is the result of love-making on the grandest scale imaginable. Because the father is an infinite in and the goddess is an infinite out, both infinities are in a constant state of contact. This great in and out creates a friction which produces a third infinity, a child, a field of operation in which the entire universe can manifest and grow. We stand at the millennial dawn of a great spiritual liberation. Obviously, we're still struggling with the responsibilities that accompany such awesome freedom. Most likely, it'll take a long time before a greater reality is universally accepted in the new aeon dawns. Each new discovery in the fields of astronomy and physics titillates us with speculations about where we're headed. Perhaps Stephen Hawking the great and the great minds of our age stand as Kepler's and Galileo's of an age to follow the aeon of Horus, an aeon that will generate a new and inconceivably magnificent pantheon of gods. And that's the end of chapter four of Angels, Demons, and Gods of the New Millennium. Tomorrow for Sunday School, we'll pick up chapter five, Passing of the Pylons. I know we went a little over. We went over uh, 30 minutes this morning. So uh, if you didn't get to see it all, I hope you uh, get a chance to replay it sometime today. Continue to have a great weekend, everybody. Continue to be good to yourself. Be careful. Be safe. Be cautious. But be joyous, too. Do what thou wilt. Shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.